I want you to turn to Mark chapter 14. You know, when God, oh God, you know, if people want to know your, your biography, your life history, it's not what you think it is. Because we think, oh, I was born, you know, my parents are such and such, and I was born in this town, and, and we give that biography. But when, but when in reality, your biography is the biography of Jesus Christ. Because you're not born of a natural human flesh anymore, John chapter 1, verse 13. You've been born of God. God is your father. You've been born of him. And if you want to know what your biography is, it's Jesus. Jesus is your bi biography. Every, everything that Jesus went through, you went through. So if you want to know what your biography is, you want to talk to people about who you are, it's about Jesus. It's about what he did. Because when he was crucified, you were crucified. When he was buried, you were buried. When he rose again, you rose again. When he was ascended, you were ascended. If you, people want to know who you are, they've got to look at Jesus because Jesus is your history. Jesus is your present. Jesus is your future. And Jesus is your biography. And we've got to stop looking at things with human eyes. We need to see through the perspective of Christ, of Jesus. So I'm going to read this story, history, his story, in Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to about 11, I think it is. But we're going to do it slowly. And I want you to, this is an invitation because what happens with a Western mindset is we sit down and we open the word and we look for something that will impact us. What's going to speak to me? What scripture do I need today? Or we go through our daily devotional and this is the scriptures that I'm reading today because this is what's on my list for me to read today. But the Bible isn't about how we study as Westerners. The scriptures are an invitation for you to enter in. You're to enter in to the word of God. Enter in to the story. Enter in. Because in all of this, God is asking you a question. And the question is, in this story, where do you see yourself? You got to step into the story. Step in. Walk it out with Jesus. Be there. Don't just read it and tick it off like I've done my Bible bit for the day. It's about reading, entering in, and walking through the scriptures with Jesus. Entering into the story. Like the wedding. No wine. Where do you see yourself? Are you part of the bridal party? Are you merry? Are you, do you see yourself connected with the ones rushing around trying to organize? How can we get wine? Do you see yourself as the servant? See, when we answer these questions, we locate where we are spiritually. You locate where you are spiritually. And then you're able to ascertain or to led by the spirit to allowing Jesus to enter into that place. What needs to be worked in us so that we truly reflect Jesus, right? Because I know at times I get pride, and pride can come from insecurities or pride can come from perfectionism. But there are different things, and we build these defences, these layers over our heart, and then we say things like, well, that's just who I am. That's just the way I am. That's not the truth. The truth is that you were born of God. And you're in Christ and Christ is in you. You're a brand new creation. You're no longer a part of the human race. You are a spiritual being. You have a dual passport. You know, you're a citizen of heaven and a citizen of Australia, but that one's priority. But what happens is that we live in such a way that even the culture we live in or the way we read the word or the way we study the word isn't connected to our heart. It's connected to our head. 
It is not about how much you've memorized or how much you've meditated. It is how much you live like Jesus. So I'm going to read this story, and I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit because anytime you open the word, it's an invitation from the Father to enter into Jesus to allow him to do a work in you. Does this make sense? So when I read this, listen for the Holy Spirit where he pulls on your heart. And you might be provoked and you think, oh, I don't like that. Well, when you get an expression like, well, I don't like that, that's an invitation to stay there because God wants to do a work in that aspect of, you, of who you are. When you are provoked, linger. So I'm going to read this and I want you to be prayerfully receptive to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And I'm going to ask some questions, questions like in this story of, of where the alabaster box was broken open and Jesus was prepared for his burial, do you see yourself as one of the onlookers? Do you see yourself as the woman who broke the alabaster bar, jar? Do you see yourself as Simon the leper? Even though he'd been healed and made whole, he was still known as Simon the leper. As you enter into this story, where do you fit? Or you might find that you look at it from different angles. But I want to read the story and I'm going to ask some questions. And I want you to, if you've got pen and paper or you've got your phone to write on, think about these things. Because in everything, God is asking you a question so that you can commune with him on a deeper level. So Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 11. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were all the while seeking to arrest Jesus by secrecy and deceit and put him to death. For they kept saying it must not be during the feast, for fear that there might be a riot of the people. And while he was in Bethany, a guest in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of ointment, perfume of pure nard, very costly, very precious. Mm -hmm. And she broke the jar and poured the perfume over his head. But there were some who were moved with indignation and said to themselves, to what purpose was this ointment wasted? For it was possible to have sold this for more than 300 denarii, a labouring man's wages for a year. We could have given the money to the poor. And they censored her and rebuked her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why are you troubling her? She's done a good and a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She came beforehand to anoint my body for the burial, and surely I tell you, wherever the good news of the gospel is proclaimed in the entire world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus and hand him over to them. And when they heard it, they rejoiced and were delighted and promised to give him money, and he sought an opportunity continually to betray Jesus. So first of all, this is this is really radical because this lady gate crashed a dinner party. Right? She gate crashed a dinner party of of dignified guests. And then she did something that was pretty shocking. It broke all the rules. So the first question is, would we have the courage to break in on something and be radical? So this is an invitation to step into this story. So she gate crashed this dinner party with dignified guests in a respectable home, and it was a scandalous act of devotion. It was judged wasteful. 
How could she do this? What kind of a woman would do that? And it said that the onlookers criticised her and judged her. So would you be part of the onlookers? You see something that's different to anything you've seen before? This is not the way it's done in church. This isn't the way it would happen with Jesus and we judge. Or turn it around. If you're in that woman's position, how do you feel when you're judged? Are we quick to defend ourselves, quick to justify ourselves? Whose side are you on in the story? Now, we was our Jesus's, of course, the woman, because that's familiarity. But if you step into the story and you come upon it like it's the first time you've read it, what would impact you? Because when we open the word, quite often what leads us is a spirit of familiarity. And that needs to be cut off from us when we study the word of God. That spirit of, oh, yeah, I know this scripture. I know what it says. I know what God's trying to say through this. Cut it off. And when you open the word, look at it like it's for the first time. And what is the Father saying to you in this? What is he wanting you to experience out of this? How is he wanting to change your heart out of this? Think about it. You've gone there. You've taken all the courage that you've got to bust this dinner party wide open. You get to Jesus. You've got an alabaster box, which is so precious and costly. And then you break it and you pour it all over his head. And you've got Simon the leper. You've got the onlookers. You've got it. Judas was there. You've got all of these people looking. It takes an enormous amount of courage to do that. She just didn't walk in and Simon say, well, welcome, come and do your thing. She broke in. She gate crashed. She broke every traditional culture that was going. And so she was criticised. What do you, How do you feel when you're criticised? What happens when you criticise others? Then we've got to start allowing the Father to ask us questions when we walk into the Word. Because a lot of us just open the word and we study it with our heads and we don't allow it to impact our heart. Walk the word. Walk the word. So, you know, there's so many different sides you could take in this story. There are the onlookers who criticized her. There's the woman. There's Jesus. There's Simon the leper. There's Judas is there. You know, who immediately took this, well, I can, I can use this against Jesus. There's so many different aspects going on in this. But what if it was you? What if you had the alabaster box and you gate crashed the dinner party to get to Jesus so you could break that box open and anoint his head? What would be your motivation? Why, what would cause you to do something so radical? Because it does take a radical revelation of Jesus to do this, doesn't it? Would you hesitate? And this is just questions we ask ourselves. Would there be a hesitation to break this expensive alabaster jar? Would we be second-guessing ourselves because, hey, you know, like Simon the leper is not real pleased, you know, Judas is going to get ticked off. Why is she wasting all of this stuff? Do we double-guess ourselves? What exactly is going on in our heart when we read this story? Put yourself in her shoes. How would you feel when the criticism came? What are you doing? That's expensive. We could use that to feed the poor. What are you doing wasting it like that? How would you feel when you come to do an act of worship and you get criticised? How would it impact you? We've got to learn to walk with him. But then listen to Jesus. He says in verse 6, leave her alone. Jesus comes to her defence. 
Have you ever felt a time when Jesus came to your defense? When he defended you against criticism, accusation, when he stepped in when you were being bullied? How did you feel? Wouldn't that make you just want to break that alabaster box even more? So he's defending you. And then he turns around and he praises her. And he said, she's done something so amazing that this is going to be talked about um, every time the good news is proclaimed in the entire world. What she's done here in this house is going to spread for the rest of the years around the world every time the gospel is preached. So he defends her and he praises her. Do you allow Jesus to have that kind of input into your life? Or do we just live our Christianity and just walk it out? You know what I mean? We have to walk closer with Jesus than we ever have in the past for the times that are coming. Yes. And not because of the times that are coming, but because of who he is. Yeah. Right? Because of who he is. How well do you know him? How well do you know our, our Messiah? Defender, praiser. Holding his ground against the onlookers who are criticizing. Knowing that Judas is going to use this to betray him. There's a whole lot of stuff that's happening here. Is there a beautiful thing that Jesus is asking you to do? That beautiful thing might be forgiving somebody who's given you a really hard time. That beautiful thing might be letting go of the past. That beautiful thing might be to do with the brokenness in our life. But is Jesus actually asking you to do something for him? What is he asking you to do? Can you break open that alabaster box? Is it a breaking of the heart, a breaking of the mind? What is it going to cost you? Because that alabaster box, when she broke it, cost her. It was a year's pay for a labourer. So if you take your alabaster box of whatever it is that God is asking you to do and you, you break it open, have you counted the cost of what it's going to cost you? What is the cost? Is there a hesitation? This woman had gone past the point of hesitation. She just stepped in. Maybe you feel a bit like Simon the leper. You know that God's done an amazing work in your life. You know that you've changed. But, hey, it feels like everybody around you has not seen the changes. But he was Simon the leper, healed, right, healed, made whole. No longer the leper, but still called Simon the leper. So are there any labels or tags on your life that you still carry from before Jesus, from before what he did in your life, from before people still tag you? Do you see yourself free of that tag? Or do you, do you still see yourself like Simon? A leper. Like, how do you see yourself? Because Jesus does amazing, radical work in us. And then to go back and still associate with the past. Crazy, hey? Even after you've changed. And then you've got Judas, who uses this to go and, and cause trouble. So in this story, who do you most identify with? And you know what? When you step into these stories in the Bible, 
Step into each group. Sense what's going on in the atmosphere. Sense where the Holy Spirit is flowing through this. We just open the Bible and we read. But there's so much more. It's not about how much I, I'm told to study the word, so we study it. But what's the point of studying it if all it does is change my intellectual capacity and doesn't change my heart and doesn't change my soul? Or I only see what I want to see. I had a minister say to me, show me your Bible, because he said, I can tell more about you from what you haven't underlined than from what you have. Wow. Because we've got our favourite scriptures, right? We know where to turn when we want something. But what if Jesus wants to turn us in a different direction and wants to use a different scripture? What if he wants to shift your relationship? What if he wants you to allow him to defend you? But also, what if he wants to praise you? Are you ready to hear the praises of Jesus over your life? Or do you think, oh, that's that's not for me? He might praise somebody else, but I don't, not for me. Have you asked to hear what Jesus would speak over your life? What would Jesus speak over you? And, you know, well done, good and faithful servant sounds a bit starchy to me. And Jesus speaks over my life. He speaks words of love, help, encouragement. When Jesus speaks into my heart, he changes me. He makes me see things I've never seen before. He opens my eyes to vistas in the heavenlies. He opens my heart to love the unlovable or to love in a way I've never loved before. And you know me, right? You know me. I'm not great with people. Keep me in my bedroom. Shut the door. Give me my Bible and some books. I'm a happy camper. I'm not extroverted. I love my alone time. But you can't love people in alone time. We actually have to mingle with one another, walk with each other. How can I pray for you? Can you pray this for me? Because we're one body, one body. We're all different cells. We're all in different positions in the body, but there's one blood, one body, one DNA, and that's the Father's, one blood, and that's the Lamb's. And we are one body, and we tend to go off this way and that way, but we're one. So when Jesus speaks to you, and I know that he speaks to you, and he comes to me, and I see him, and I know he does that with others in the church, in the ecclesia, but do you have a pattern of communication where it's always the same kind of thing? Or do you allow Jesus to open up new lines of communication? To take you places you've never been before. To show you things in the word that you've never had revealed before. Do you allow him that privilege? Or do you have a one-track relationship this is what my friendship with Jesus is like. This is how it walks, works out. This is what we do. This is how we do it. This is how he speaks to me. This is what I get from him. Or are you open to change? And I keep going back to what Bruno Roche said at the ASP conference, that when the Israelites were walking in the wilderness and they were fed with the manna, manna in the Hebrew means what is it? It's a question. It's a question. What is this? Question. And he said to the Hebrews, God was ask, was feeding the Israelites with questions. So we ask God a lot of questions, right? 
But what are the questions God is asking you? What question is he asking you? Where are you? Like he said to Adam. Where's your brother? Like he said to Cain. He's always asking questions because those questions open up a new dialogue and a new path and a new intimacy into our relationship with him. So you're listening for his questions. What is he asking you? So as you read this, when the anointing, Jesus is anointed for the for his funeral. You know, the woman comes, she breaks into the dinner party. Man, that gate crashed. Gate crashed. What question is he asking you as you read this? In your favorite scripture, what is the question that he's asking you? What is the question? Well, our favorite scriptures, we know them, we can re recite them, we've got them memorized, we can pray them, we understand our favorite scripture. Got it. Times of trouble, that's the scripture. That's where I go, know that scripture. But what is the Father actually asking you in that scripture? See, this is his story. It's not ours. It's his story. And he's invited us into it. So what is he asking you? Where is he challenging you? Sometimes people feel so broken that they think they don't have an alabaster box. And if they did have an alabaster box, whatever was precious in it's just seeped out through the hardness of life. So sometimes when they, people read this, they feel jealous because they don't have an alabaster box. They don't have anything of value in their life to give to the Lord. That's how some people feel. Well, how do you feel? In reality, if you feel so broken that you've got nothing to offer, that's a beautiful gift. And the oil that flows out is faith in that Jesus just loves you anyway. There are so many different things that Jesus wants to do in us, but we have this one-track mentality of a relationship with him, which has been fed by church culture, fed by Western mindset, fed by, you know, intellectualism. And it's not about that. It is about the heart. It is about what Jesus is speaking to you. What do you have to do? Where is he asking you to go? Here are my Lord, send me, said Isaiah. I might say things like, here are my Lord, send me, but not to Uganda. Guess, <laughs> send Mike. Yeah. Here am I, Lord. Send Aaron, says Moses. You know, so we've all got these different aspects. But let's let's face it, Jesus, God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, they're wanting to do something so much more in us than what we've ever led them because we are the ones that set the boundaries for our relationship. God does not set the boundary for our relationship with him. We do. We can be as close to the Father or as far away as we choose. And because he will not violate our free will, he lets us do that. He loves you. So he's always working to draw you ever closer. Always working that you get a greater revelation of Jesus. Always working so you know the power of the Holy Spirit in a more definite way. And in all of the stuff that's happening in the world, do not get caught up to such an extent that it's all about end times and you miss out on your relationship with Jesus. Because if your relationship isn't right, who cares what happens in end times? You're going you're gonna to fluff it somewhere. The relationship's got to be there. And so when you open the, book, the word, please step into it. Step into it. I love stepping into Psalm 119. That is one of my favorite places to walk. Psalm 119. I love Psalm 119. It ministers to me in times of dryness, in times when I'm not getting any answers. It ministers to me when I'm looking for wisdom. It ministers to me when I'm being persecuted by other, other pastors or other Christians or whatever. It ministers to me. I love walking through Psalm 119. Love it. So, you know, but I've got to learn to walk through it. Jesus, I'm, you are the words. I'm, Psalm 119, Jesus, this is you. Holy Spirit, will you take me through Psalm 119? Let me walk it out with Jesus. 
and stop. In the places where you feel pulled in your heart, stop. When you feel provoked and get angry, sometimes I get angry at the word of God. Am I the only one that gets angry at scripture? I do not want to forgive them, Lord. Do you know what they did to me? Hello. I do not want to forgive them. Maybe next week, but right now, right now, I want to stew in my unforgiveness. We all get angry at times with the word. But wherever you're provoked, linger. Because that's where the Lord is wanting to do something amazing in you, through you, with you, for you, around you. Allow yourself to be provoked by the word. Allow yourself to be challenged, to be stirred, to be excited, to be passionate. Allow it to draw you to prayer. Allow it to release the praises. You know, because, oh, my gosh, Lord, you're amazing. Like we looked at Isaiah before um, at 1 o'clock when we did the study in Isaiah and all the names of God that are in the book of Isaiah. Man, you could spend ages just praying them through. Let Allow it to, to release worship and everything in you. But step into the word. Don't just open it. Don't just read it. Don't just underline it. Don't look up your strongs or just and think that's your study. What better way to study the word than with the author, the Holy Spirit? Study it with the Holy Spirit. Because I tell you, I can study it with all these different commentaries and everything like that. You know, I've got so many commentaries. You know how many books I've got. And then you've got all the, the Kindle versions and everything else. But if I study with those commentaries, guess who I'm studying with? Other people, anointed maybe, but I'm studying with other people and I might think they're the greatest teacher in the world, but they're not the Holy Ghost. So I need to study the word with the Holy Spirit. I need to ask Jesus as the word to open up to me so that I can open up to him. So as you, as you take that scripture or any other scripture that the Lord shows you, it is an invitation to step into it and to partake of the journey. Whether it's the journey with Adam and Eve going through the Garden of, Je of, you know, Garden of Eden and, and the snake being there, whether it's the journey of something else, but it's a journey. He wants you to walk it out with him. Don't just read it, categorize it, think, yeah, that's it. I can see where that fits with this and this fits with that and I've got it all together. That's that's the way I can see that now. You know, hey, great if you can, but if it doesn't change you, if you haven't been confronted by it, challenged by it, excited by it, made passion, impassioned by it, what's the point of more knowledge? There is no anointing on knowledge. The anointing is on your relationship. The anointing is on your relationship. I can study the word. I can study, you know, the people I think are great teachers and I can stand here and I can fluff out everything that I think that they've said and I might have studied it so much that it flows out effortlessly but if it's not from my heart, from my spirit, there is no anointing. It is just information. Head knowledge. It needs to, I need to have a walk with Jesus through the word of God. This woman was extravagant in her worship. It was an alabaster box. You know how pretty that is, how beautiful that is, how valuable that is. And she just broke it and let the oil pour out. It's extravagant, but it wasn't wasteful. God extravagantly loves you, lavishly loves you, has poured everything out for you. Don't be wasteful with what he's given you. Keep company with Jesus. It's all about a purity of heart. Are you the alabaster box that's been broken? Do you feel like your life's just poured out? I've got nothing left to give. Tired, I'm this, I'm that, I've got nothing left, God, nothing left. 
What a gift to bring back to Jesus. God, I am broken. I'm tired. There is nothing left in me. But I still come to you. I still give you whatever you can do with this. And he says, I love you. Let me make it brand new. Let me touch you. Let me redeem you. Let me restore you. Let me refresh you. Let me fill you. Let me give you life. We can no longer. This is a different season. Do we have to be out of here too? <laughs> well, we might just have to pack up and head somewhere else. But it looks like that you have to um, I'll just see what's going to happen because I was going to ask you to do something. This woman did a beautiful thing. Do you recognise beautiful things in other people? Do you recognise beautiful things in other people? Because sometimes we don't see the beautiful things in our own lives. But sometimes, you know, we don't tell each other how much we, we really like this in somebody. You know, the way you pray or I just love the way you walk through difficulties, whatever it might be, sometimes we don't tell them. We don't tell people. And people need to be told. Just like Jesus praised that woman. So just inspire each other for a minute. You are the fragrance of Christ. Everywhere you go, you release the fragrance of Christ. You are incredibly powerful. 